Welcome to Lakeside Presbyterian Church. We're so glad to see you all. It's nice to have old faces return and new faces this week, so welcome. If you are here for the first time, we have a welcome bag for you, and it's very important that you get it, very important, because inside the bag, there's a very special welcome cookie. Muy importante, as we say in Espanol. So please get yourself a welcome bag because it's also got information about our church in here and a copy of Our Daily Bread for a devotional for you. So there's that. And if you um, like what you see, <laughs> we invite you to become our church family, part of our church family. And you can stay in touch with all of us on WhatsApp. So you can talk to me or you can talk to Pastor Wayne, give us your phone number, we'll put you on WhatsApp and you'll um, be able to stay in touch with, particularly with prayer requests. That's a lot of what we communicate about is when people are in need of prayer. So that would be great. And in fact, if you have a prayer request, we have prayer request forms probably un under the seat in front of you. There's a little clipboard. I think there should be prayer request forms there. You can fill it out, put it in the uh, offering plate, and we will communicate whatever that is to our whole praying congregation, and we'd love to pray for you. We have some announcements that are on the back of your bulletin today. A few that are a little different. One of, one of them that's not so different is our Wednesday Bible study at 10 a.m. in the church library. We have a praise and worship team rehearsal at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. I got that right this week, yay. And next week, we, are, we have announced on here our annual general meeting on next Sunday, but that's a little bit up in the air. It may be postponed until August 5th. We had a, um, our session meeting yesterday and had some questions about the budget. We're not so sure if we're going to have everything straightened out. February 5th. Did I say August? Wow. Wow. <laughs> I... I'm hoping for summer really soon. I'm tired of the long sleeves. That's hilarious. Okay, and, and we've got a church bazaar coming up that, for fundraising. That's coming up on February 18. That's a Saturday. And you, um, if you have anything that you would like to donate that we can sell at the church, we have a whole list here of things that we'd love to have if you've got extra of. And the proceeds will benefit our feeding programs. We have a very special, and oh wait, before I get to that, is anybody going to the U.S. who could take mail this week? Because sometimes people bring mail here to deliver. No, it doesn't look like anybody's leaving. All right, we have one special announcement that Jane Piper is going to give us. Good morning. On behalf of the Hospitality Committee, I'd like to invite all of you to our first Fifth Sunday brunch. This will be held two weeks from today. I think that's January 30th. Anyway, our theme for this first brunch centers around bagels. <laughs> We will have bagels, and we will have a, mu a multitude of savory and sweet toppings. Now, how can you help? Well, after church, Bev Lawton, Bev Layton, Layton. Oh, there, there she is. Okay, will be in the North Ex with a sheet showing everything we're going to be serving. And you can choose what you'd like to bring. Now, if it's impossible for you to do that, we've got an alternative. We're asking that you donate 100 pesos towards our dispenser program. So either way, you're included. Um, I hope you'll come great way to socialize. And if you have any questions, talk to me or Phyllis or Bev. Okay? Thanks very much. 
We're very excited that we get to do this brunch. It's been since before COVID that we've gotten together, <laughs> except for um, Thanksgiving dinner. But we used to have um, brunches, lunches, potlucks after church once a month. And we haven't done that in years. So this is exciting news for me anyway, because I like to eat. Um, I think that's all of our announcements today. So why don't we get into why we really came this morning, and that's to worship our Lord. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, your majesty is beyond imagination. You're the eternal king, high and lifted up, whom the angels worship. Your power is beyond understanding, creator God, who shakes the heavens, yet holds us in his hands. Your mercy is beyond our deserving, Savior God, born for us and sacrificed in love. Fill us now with the desire to worship you in spirit and in truth, as in a moment of silence we turn our hearts to you. We come before you now, Lord, asking you to receive our worship and fill us with your spirit through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our scriptural call to worship this morning, oops, never mind, I don't have a scriptural call for, to worship in my notes today, so please stand and sing our first song together, page 95, praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him. Praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with those honors ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Please remain standing for our responsive reading. The responsive reading today is Psalm 40, verses 1 to 11. Please join me in the bold-faced type. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. 
burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, Here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. Please be seated. Our first reading this morning is Isaiah 49, verses 1 to 7. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord. And my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and the Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. This is the word of the Lord. You may remain seated for our next song. Our second reading is 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 to 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sacrificed in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God, the
thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Now please stand for a reading of the Gospel. A reading from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples, and when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Now we come to our time of prayer, asking for God's grace on our church, our world, our neighbors, and ourselves. Let's pray together. Dear Father, you are the perfect light of revelation. As you shone in the life of Jesus, whose epiphany we celebrate, we ask you to shine in us and through us, that we may become beacons of truth and compassion, enlightening all creation with deeds of justice and mercy. We are here to worship you today. We love you, Lord, and because we love you, we always want to keep your commandments. We are thankful to you, gracious Father, that you have called us to be the church, the body of your son, Jesus. We ask that you keep all of us who proclaim faith in Christ in unity, that together we may more effectively proclaim the good news to the world, that all who hear may know that you are love and turn to you and your son, Jesus. In this light, Lord, please bless our membership with fresh zeal to love one another, more loving patience for each other, a deeper commitment to serve one another. Also, we can show the reality of your salvation. Shine your radiant holiness into our lives, that we may offer our hands and our hearts to your work, to heal and shelter, to feed and to clothe. We pray especially, Father, for each of the churches in our community that call on your name asking that you would provide energy and vision to their leadership, encouragement and enthusiasm to their congregations, and blessings on all their efforts to bring you glory. And for Lakeside Presbyterian Church, please give us wisdom to continually seek you. Father, we thank you for all the ways you've expressed your goodness to us this week. You've forgiven us for every sin. You've given us our daily bread. You've provided us a beautiful place to live. You've given us this church family, and we especially thank you for answered prayer for Roger for his surgery that went well and, and the fact that he's on his way to full recovery. And we continue to pray for his recovery and for Elisa as well. We are bold to ask you to look with special compassion on those who are sick, in pain, or in trouble in our community. We pray for Gary's upcoming surgery that all will go well and that he will recover completely and will no longer suffer in pain. We pray for healing for Nelda. May your love surround her. Please continue to heal Renee. 
We also pray for Marvin's healing and for strength for Barbara as she cares for him. We pray for Captain Joe, now in hospice. Be, be present with him and bring him peace during his journey home. We pray, too, for Suzanne as she's cared for by their son. We ask for your care for Catherine and John Gonzalez. We remember Catherine Burson and her needs for healing and for new housing. We pray for those who are experiencing chronic pain and illness, including Betty, Bree, Donna, Vanessa, Susana, and Alfonso. Father, we ask you to bring healing as a sign of your grace and show all of us more clearly how we can be the instruments of your love and grace to these and others in our community who are suffering. We now ask you to prepare our hearts to receive your word this morning. May it change us. For what good is hearing your word unless it does that? Wash us, shape us, refine us, shatter our misconceptions about you, reconstruct our values, and make us different. As John the Baptist said, make us less and you more, for that would be best of all. And now, Father, we join together in praying the prayer your son Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now please stand and sing Shout to the Lord. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath all that I may be seated. Well, today we're going to be looking at the book of John. And the title for this is The Unique Son. And that's what John is all about. John is different from the other three Gospels. The other three are called the synoptics because they are very similar. They use many of the same stories and parables and miracles. But John, which was probably written sometime later, is very different. It is the most theological, and some say the most spiritual. It was probably written by John the Apostle. And John uh, wrote this when he was somewhat older. He is probably the Apostle that is called in the Gospel the one that Jesus loved. And so I'm going to read today the scripture, John 3.16, and if you memorize this as I did when you were a child, uh, you can say that aloud with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but that they have eternal life eternal life. And that's what this is all about. Actually, the way that I'm going to approach this, I'm going to only look at three chapters. Uh, chapter 2, 3, and 4. And this deals with some of the encounters that Jesus had. Uh, first of all, there is the encounter with Mary. And if we could move on to the scripture, 
It says in John 2, 3, When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now, in this story, there was a wedding in Cana, and uh, at that wedding, people came from great distances. Now, they did not have telegraphs, <laughs> certainly didn't have cell phones. There was no telling when people were going to arrive. And so the host was supposed to have everything ready. All the food was to be prepared. All the wine was to be ready. And if it was not, if something ran out, it was a great disgrace to the family. And it was such a horrible thing, people wanted to make sure there was always plenty. So Mary went to Jesus, and she said, they've run out of wine. And Jesus said, well, woman, why are you talking to me about this? Uh, my hour has not yet come. Now, after this, she ignores what he said. That, I have my, my, my second wife, and I understand that wives often ignore what we say. Uh, my wife asked if we could have a dog, and I said no. And we now have two dogs. <laughs> now, I think there must be a book that's handed down among the women about how uh, to, to deal with men, and that must be one of the things in the book. You know, about how to, when the guy says no, how to still get what you want without saying anything. So anyway, Mary said to the servants, do whatever he asks. And so Jesus told the servants, fill these giant containers that held 25 to 30 gallons each, and they were used for ritualistic purification. They didn't talk about germs in that day, but this was for religious purification. And they had these great big uh, jars. And Jesus said, fill them up. And they did. And he said, well, then take a dip and bring that to the master of the ceremonies. And they did. And he reported, he said, this is strange. Most often at a banquet like this, they serve the best wine first, and then after people get maybe a little tipsy later on, they bring out the inferior wine. But he said, you have saved the best wine until last. And I want you to think about that transformation that took place. Uh, some of you are probably more versed in science than I am, but I, I do know about H2O, that water two parts hydrogen and one of oxygen, but wine is a lot more complex because the wine contains sugar, it contains alcohol, it contains all kinds of other chemicals in addition to the water. It is very different, and so at the microscopic level, it was completely transformed, completely changed. I think that there are a couple of meanings that we can get from this passage. First of all, it tells us about that in verse 11 of chapter 2. This was done to glorify Christ, and that certainly is important. But I think that there's another meaning. The transformation for us takes place at the very lowest of all of our levels. Our entire being is transformed by Christ, and I, I know that you are like me. I, I want to be transformed by him. Not just changed a little bit on the surface, but utterly and completely transformed. I want to be, as Paul said, conformed to his image. I have died, and now Christ lives within me. Transformation. Uh, John Hutton was a well-known Welsh preacher. And one day in the middle of his sermon, this guy stood up and led the congregation in singing the doxology. And he thought that was a little bit odd, and so he wanted to talk to the man and find out what was going on. And so he went and he said to the man, well, you know, what, what's happening? He said, well, I just get so excited about how Christ has changed me. He said, 
Uh, before I was a drunk, he said, I even sold and pawned our furniture in order to have money to do that. He said, I sometimes knocked my wife around. But he said, I'm a completely different man today. And I'm so excited that I, I sometimes can't even just sit down. And so the preacher said, well, what about the people at work, how are they responding? He said, well, I work in the pit. And some of them said, you don't really believe that yarn about changing the water into wine, do you? He said, well, I don't really know that much about water and wine, but I know that in my house he changed beer into furniture. A transformation at the atomic level. And Christ is able to transform us like that. We ought never to be satisfied with just a superficial transformation. Secondly, after the transformation, the, the encounter with Mary, there is the encounter with Nicodemus in chapter 3. It says in 3, 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now this is a fascinating story because Nicodemus, who was on the Jewish council, a very important man, a scholar, came to Jesus at night. Now, he knew that Jesus was different, but he came at night probably because he didn't want anybody else to see him. And he went to Jesus and he said, no one can do the things that you do unless the Spirit of God is in him. Now, how different was that from the other Pharisees that recognized Jesus performed miracles? Uh, they could not deny that, but they said he cannot possibly be getting his power from God. It must be from the devil, from Beelzebub. But Nicodemus recognizes it must be coming from God. And Jesus said to him, you cannot even see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. Now, Nicodemus even though he was a Bible scholar, was confused. He said, I'm an old man. How can I possibly go back into my mother's womb and be born again? I can't do that, can I? And Jesus said, you're a teacher and you don't understand even the simple things when I say to you that you must be born again. Jesus said, flesh, which is flesh, can only be flesh. And things of the Spirit can only be of the Spirit. He said, you must be born of water. And I believe that is the birth of the flesh. We are born with water. But he said, just being born of the flesh does not mean that you will ever see the kingdom of God. That only comes by being born again of the Holy Spirit. And so finally, Nicodemus has, come, has to come to grips with an understanding that simply being born does not save anyone. By simply being a Jew, it does not save anyone. By being born into a spiritual or a Christian family, does not save anyone. You must be born of the Holy Spirit of God. It took me some time to understand how important that was. Uh, sometimes I would tell people about Jesus, that he lived a perfect life, that he died, that he arose, and we have to believe in him. And then if they were reluctant, I would try to force it. But I, I, I came to understand Sometimes I could get a convert, but it wasn't a convert of the Spirit. The Spirit of God has to be present in their lives for them to make that kind of decision, for them to come to that understanding. I was watching a television program, a talk show one day, years ago, and a woman was asked about her beliefs, and she said, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I am not the born-again kind. I, I don't know if she was really a Christian or not, 
maybe she had a complete misunderstanding or she had never read the book of John. But Jesus says it is not an option. He said you must be born again in order to even see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. Now the ABCs of salvation are pretty simple. And that is you admit to your own sins. And the Bible says if you say that you not, are not a sinner, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Secondly, you must believe in Jesus. And the, the verse that we quoted earlier, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. And then he goes on to say, What do you have to do to be lost? He said, he that does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What do you have to do to be lost? Absolutely nothing. If you're born of the flesh, that's where you are until you are born again of the Spirit. In Evansville, Indiana, there was a man and he was called old Bill. He was an old man and he lived a pretty despicable life. And old Bill often got drunk and on one occasion he got into a fight and he lost an eye. And they started calling him One-Eyed Bill. That's the way it would have ended but he came to know the Savior. And it completely changed his life. He started working and volunteering at a mission in Evansville. And they started calling him New Bill because he was not the same person that he was before. And he was known by that name until the day that he died. The second encounter is with Nicodemus. Jesus said to him, you must be born again. And then there is the final encounter. The first one, the new wine. The second, the new birth. And the third one is the encounter with the Samaritan woman in chapter 4. And it says in 4.15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. Now, Jesus and his disciples did something really odd. They stopped at a Samaritan village, the village of Sychar. And that was unusual because the Jews despised the Samaritans for several reasons. First of all, they despised them because when the Jews were carried off into captivity in Babylon, some of the people that stayed married the people of the land, the Idumeans. And they were basically half Jews. And so when the Jews came back, they didn't want these Samaritans to participate in the building of the temple or anything else. Also, the Samaritans accepted only some books of the Old Testament, not all. The Jews worshiped at Mount Zion in Jerusalem and so the Samaritans developed their own place, Mount Gerizim, where they worshipped. And so sometimes the pious Jews, going from the south to the north, wouldn't even go in through Samaria. They would cross the Jordan to go away from them to come back into the north. And so it was unusual for Jesus to go through and then to stop there and then Jesus sent the disciples into town to find food. And while Jesus was there, a woman walked up to get water. Now, this was unusual. It was the middle of the day. Normally, the women would come together, and they would come in the morning when it was cool. But this woman came by herself. And the most logical thing to assume is because of her terrible reputation. Others didn't want to have anything to do with her, and so she was forced to come by herself. 
And she was really startled when Jesus said, would you give me a drink of water? And she said, well, you're a Jew. <laughs> you would ask me for a drink of water? And he said, absolutely. He said, if you knew who was asking, he would give you living water. Now, this living water was an amazing thing because he said, if you drink of ordinary water, you will grow thirsty again. But if you drink of the living water, it will be like an eternal spring flowing up in you, giving you eternal life. She said, well, I would love never to be thirsty and to have some of that living water. And so... Then Jesus said, well, bring your husband. And she didn't really want to go into that because uh, she was a great sinner. And she said, well, I have no husband. And Jesus declared, you're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband at all. Well, we don't really like to be confronted with our sin, and it seems that the next thing that she did was to try to change the subject. She can say, said, I, I can see you're a prophet. Where's the right place to worship? Should we worship here at Samaria, Mount Gerizim, or uh, is God to be worshipped in Jerusalem with the place of the Jews? And Jesus said, well, the time is coming that People are not going to be worshiping in any one of those. He said, God is spirit, and those that worship him will worship in spirit and in truth. I'm glad that she asked that question because it lets us know that the spirit of God is with us every Sunday where two or three are gathered in his name. The spirit of God is among us. God can be worshiped anywhere. He is everywhere present. When I lived in Canada, I went to Niagara Falls. And I even got on the little boat, uh, the Maid of the Mist. I guess some of you have been on that. and uh, You have to put on a raincoat because you get really wet. There are millions of gallons of water pouring over Niagara Falls every minute. And I couldn't help but think, ah, Jesus was even greater than that. An artesian well that never runs out. And we drink of that and we have eternal life and we are never thirsty again. A number of years ago, Henry Kissinger made the statement that everybody has to find a purpose and meaning in life. He said, even a terrorist who kills people tries to find a meaning of life in that. And on that occasion, Henry Kissinger was right. You and I find our purpose, our meaning in Christ. He is the living water. He gives us a purpose and a meaning that we could not have otherwise. And so all you see in uh, the book of John, all the new things, uh, the new wine, the new birth, uh, the new water, the living water. And at the center of all of this is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life only begotten. You know, that's one way of translating it. The word is monogonous in Greek. You're probably not interested in that, but let me tell you how it is often translated in Greek. It is often translated unique. You and I are children of God. We are children because God has adopted us by our profession of faith in Christ by making him our Lord. But Jesus was the unique Son of God, the only one that never sinned, the only one that was perfect, 
and the one that died on the cross that we might have eternal life. What a great message that is. And because of what Christ has done, we are to live our lives in perpetual gratitude. In Victoria Station in London, some years ago, there were three men that got on the train. And one man was sitting on one side and two others on the other side. Those two men were fairly young, in their 30s. And as the train pulled out about 20 minutes later, one of those men began to have a seizure. And the other one you know, held him up, took off his coat and put it under the man's head. And then he took his handkerchief and he wiped his face and his mouth. And he just said calming words until the man finally was able to calm down. And he looked at the one that was sitting across from him and he said, we apologize for that. This sometimes happens two or three times a day. He said, my friend and I were in Vietnam together and we were both shot. I was shot in my legs. I could not walk. And he was shot in the shoulder. Helicopter was supposed to come, but it did not. And so he said, my friend picked me up and started carrying me and there were shots all around from the Viet Cong. He said, many times as he was walking, trying to carry me, I told him, just put me down and save yourself, but he refused. He said, how he managed to walk for three and a half days until we got out of the jungle, I will never know. He said, about five years ago, I learned that he had this medical condition. And so I sold my home and got what money I had and came to take care of him. And he looked at the guy across from him and said, you know, after what he did for me, there isn't anything that I would not do for my friend. Jesus has done so much more than that for all of us. He lived a life. He was beaten with whips that cut all the way to the bone. He bled. He was nailed to a cross with iron nails and he died there that you and I might have salvation. And what we are to do is to live every day in gratitude for what he has done. That changes us. We become new. Would you bow with me? Our Father, we thank you for this day and for your word that instructs us and we pray that you might help us to live in accordance with your purpose. God, not only change us, but transform us. Make us truly after the image of Christ. And we pray that when other people see us as we go through our lives, that they will see Christ. Forgive us, God, when we fail you. We do pray today for those that have concerns and needs. Be with Bill and his medical condition. We pray for Gary, that you'll be with him as he has his operation. Uh, be with Marvin, and God, we ask that you'll guide him and also be with Barbara. And finally, God, we pray for Catherine, that you will help her and John during this very difficult time in their lives. For any others in our congregation or our friends and families, we pray that you might watch over us. Thank you, God, for who you are. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God has been so generous in all that he's given to us and all the blessings that we enjoy. So let us now show our gratitude by returning a portion of God's gifts to him through this church and its work in our own body and in the larger community. Let's pray together. Creator God, your gifts overwhelm us. We thank you for all the blessings you have poured out on us and we pray that these gifts we return to you will honor you by making your glory better known. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
stand and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him from all the be seated. We now come to our time of communion when we share together in the body and blood of Jesus Christ in recognition of his great sacrifice for us. Here at Lakeside Presbyterian Church, we practice open communion, meaning that all baptized believers in Jesus Christ may share at this table. But of course, this is not to be taken lightly. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about partaking in this communion, he says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So now as we prepare to come to the table of the Lord, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Please pray with me. Almighty Father, we remember that our Lord, your son Jesus, was tempted in every way as we are, yet was without sin. Because of this, we are assured that he can sympathize with us in our weakness. So, we are bold to approach your throne of grace, Lord, asking for mercy, for forgiveness of our sins, and for grace in our time of need. Forgive us now, Lord, as each of us in the silence of our own hearts confesses to you our private sins. Holy God, forgive us the smallness of our faith, the magnitude of our need, the depth of our sorrow. Raise us up to new life and new ways of service through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Hear now the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone as though it were never there, and a new life has begun. As you've confessed your sins and truly repented, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. I have a few words of instruction. After the words of institution, the ushers will release the rows one at a time, starting at the back to come down the center aisle. And once you've received the elements, go back down the side aisles to return to your seats. If you're unable to come forward, we'll bring the elements to you immediately after everyone has been served. And one thing that we do that's a little different here at this church is as a sign that we take this communion as a celebration of our personal relationship with Jesus, please eat the bread immediately as you receive it. And then as a sign that we also share in this communion as a community that is the body of Christ, please take the cup back to your seat with you and we will all drink together after everyone has been served. Thank you. It has been written that God needs absolutely nothing from us, but he wants our love, appreciation, and worship. And I know that without the sacrifice of Jesus' body and his blood, we would have no hope of heaven when death comes. It seems very little to ask that during the communion or the Lord's Supper that we focus on just what the greatness of these actions mean for us. 
In the beginning, God created us for himself. But even though we have fallen through our disobedience to sin and death, God, in his infinite mercy and grace and love, sent his only begotten Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to live among us. He suffered. He suffered every hardship and trial, adversity and trouble and temptation that we face, except without sin. And finally, he stretched out his arms upon the cross in perfect obedience to the will of the Father and offered himself as a sacrifice of sins for the sins of the whole world. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and after he had blessed, he said, Drink this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Therefore, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup in faith, we do so in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ, proclaiming his death until he comes again. Will the communion service kindly come forward?
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take and feed on them in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Before we drink in the cup together, I want to uh, read a scripture. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Let's all drink of the cup together, shall we? Let's pray. Jesus, we believe in you and therefore we belong to you. Help us to stand up for you openly and spread the good news of your salvation and your resurrection life. Amen. Let's stand together for our final hymn. and majesty, human and deity, in perfect harmony, the one who is God, Lord of eternity, dwells in humanity, kneels in humility, and washes our feet. receive this the benediction just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and redeem so God sends you into the world this day to be light and love healing and hope go now and be light for the world amen Remember, you're invited to our coffee hour after church. Thank you.